ಓಂ ಸದಾ ಶಿವ ಸಮಾರಂಭಾ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರಾ ಓಂ ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯಂಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿ ನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ತ್ರೈಲೋಕ್ಯನಾಥ ಹರಿ ಮೀಡ್ಯ ಮುದಾರ ಸತ್ವ ಶಕ್ತೇಸ್ತನೂಜತನಯ ಪರಮೇಷ್ಠಿ ಕಲ್ಪ ಜೀಮೂತ ಮುಕ್ತ ವಿಮಲಾಂಬರ ಚಾರುವರ್ಣ ವಾಶಿಷ್ಠ ಮುಗ್ರ ತಪಸ ಪ್ರಣತೋಸ್ಮಿ ನಿತ್ಯ ವಿಸೃಜನ್ನಮಯಾಶು ಪಂಚಶು ತಾಂ ಅಹಮಸ್ಮಿ ಮೇತಿ ಮತಿ ಸತತ ದೃಶಿಮನಂತ ಮೃತ ವಿಗುಣ ಹೃದಯ ಸ್ಥಮೇಹಿ ಸದಾಹಮಿತಿ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದರ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಸಾ ಇನ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಅನ್ನಮಯಾಶು ಪಂಚಸು ಸೊ ದ ಫೈವ್ ಕೋಶಾಸ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅನ್ನಮಯ ತಾಂ ಅಹಮಸ್ಮಿ ಮಮೇ ಇತಿ ಮತಿ ಸತತ ವಿಸೃಜ so don't take those koshas as you or i or mine even okay that thought that wrong notion you give up always then what is the truth what is the correct notion which you should have means drishi roopam i am the uh, of the nature of consciousness which is the one which knows whether your eyes are seeing or not ears are hearing or not like that okay which is the one which is the witness of all your thoughts so it is the one which is lighting up your mind your intellect all your sense organs so the entire sukshma sharira in fact so that drishi roopam drishi swaroopam which is also ananta which is limitless because it is not an object in space time in fact space time is in you you are not in space time that is the first or the biggest mistake one has is that i am an object in space time is a fundamental error everything else follows from there because then you become a limited being as soon as you think you are an object in space time you are limited by space time and all the objects all other objects in the space time but the truth is you are not an object in space time in fact you are not at all an object that's why that's why the trishi roopam is said first you are not an object at all space time is an object in fact in your consciousness in your awareness so that's why you are ananta and you are satyam ritam because whatever is cognized as an object those things they keep on changing but you are the invariable subject who never undergoes any change and who does not have any qualities vigunam and how do where do i know it means you have to know it in your own intellect only because that's where it is available it is available as the i i i or, or as the awareness the awareness which is available in your own buddhi that is what is you that the swarupa of that so that's what i am always know that that is the teaching in fact so now but the there is a question or a doubt which rises here see most people can accept that i am a conscious being there is no problem in that that i am not what i see also they will be able to accept it it's a very simple thing correct right? whatever i see is not i this kind of an analysis you can do and arrive at a conclusion that i am a conscious being consciousness is my nature that is the only one which is intrinsic to me everything else is only transient whatever is intrinsic nature of me is that i am a conscious aware being this much everybody can accept but then they will say that but how can this be the limitless <laughs> how can this be only one because i see many conscious beings correct so i see many people with whom i i interact 
there are many sentient beings in my world there are insentient things also so then how you can say this is only one and it is limitless so this is a problem in fact this is where shastra is the pramana really speaking because up to this point even you don't require shastra to just arrive at an understanding that i am a conscious aware being anybody can arrive at that conclusion but the shastra is required as a pramana as a means of knowledge to say that you are the limitless that is the teaching and then so how do we explain that how do we even show you that it is possible there has to be a possibility of you being the limitless in fact that is what you instinctively seek also correct all of us are instinctively seeking freedom from all limitation so that itself has to point to a certain fact that that limitless has to be there otherwise why should we be instinctively all the time seeking that limitless but even <laughs> that is only but that's not a very clinching argument or anything but that at least shows you the possibility that there has to be a limitless but shastra is giving you certain analogy now okay so what is the analogy that's what now totaka acharya is continuing with that to to remove this doubt so he says jala bheda krita bahute varave he ghatika adi krita na bhaso piyatha mati bheda krita tu tatha bahuta tava buddhi drisho vikritasya sadha so <clears throat> jala bheda krita bahuta iva bahuta bahuta means it is the uh, manyness you can say correct so the ta there is nothing but to show the ness bahuta means manyness and manyness of sun let us say sun is only one everybody knows that there is only one sun in the sky but then there can be many suns how because sun gets reflected in many reflecting media like different water bodies are there jala bheda so the bheda or the differences are there in the reflecting media and due to that it appears as though there are many suns or there are manyness is there in sun correct ravehe bahuta that there are many suns are there it is there it is like that even though sun is one now this analogy also is not something totaka acharya himself has used first time or anything it is there in the bhagavad gita correct if you read the 13th chapter of bhagavad gita bhagavan uses the same analogy yatha prakashayat ekah kritsnam lokam imam ravihi kshetram kshetri tatha kritsnam prakashayati bharata i think it is at the end of 13th chapter in gita you can go and see this verse yatha prakashayati ekah ekah ravihi correct so even the word ravi is used there also for sun one sun alone is lighting or brightening up or lighting up this entire world krishnam lokam this entire world is lighted up by one sun so yatha prakashayat ekah krishnam lokam imam ravihi kshetram kshetri tatha krishnam krishnam kshetram all the kshetras are being lighted up by only one kshetri in fact that's how the chapter also starts correct kshetragnam chaapi mam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata the 13th chapter itself starts with that it says that in the all the kshetras you know me as the kshetragnya the kshetragnya the knower of the field kshetra is field means everything is a field any object of knowledge is a kshetra or a field and the one who knows the field there are not many knowers of field understand that but that is the thing which we think it is the truth correct because we think that every sentient being is a separate consciousness but that's not true 
Bhagavan starts, he says that in every kshetra, I am the kshetra jnaha. There is only one I. There is only one knower of the field in every field. In fact, in every body-mind sense complex is a kshetra again. In every body-mind sense complex, there is only one consciousness which is lighting up or which is making that body-mind sense complex sentient. It is, what is the analogy? Like even the sun is lighting up everything in this world. In fact, Bhashyakara there, in the Bhashya, I remember, interestingly, he says that this analogy shows you two things it teaches you. One is, there is only one consciousness, like even there is only one sun, correct? That is important to understand. But one more thing also he points out. What he says is, Alepakaha also he says. Like the sun itself is untouched by whatever it is lighting up. It may be lighting up good, bad, ugly, whatever. It, it's up to you. But, and it may be reflecting in some ugly water where it is distorted or it may be reflecting in clear water where it, it looks like the original almost. But sun itself is untouched by whatever it is lighting up or where it is reflecting is immaterial. Correct? So both the things are brought out by this sun analogy that there is only one sun, which is important to understand. And that sun itself is untouched. That means what? Whatever is happening in your body, mind, sense complex, you are untouched by that as a conscious being. That is why it's all only state of mind. Whatever may be at the end of the day, see, as a sadhaka, we have to... What is the sadhana all about? Sadhana is all about preparing your mind only. It's all about attaining a certain disposition of mind because manasa eva anudrashtavyam shastra says you have to see with your mind only. You have to know the truth of yourself with the mind, with the intellect. But then it requires a samskrita manaha. Samskrita means what? Well, well matured, well cooked. <laughs> Pakwa, we call it. Correct? Maturity and certain disposition of mind is required to, to understand your own truth. Okay? So you have to do all the sadhana for that. All effort is for that. And even Shastra Shravana Manana Nididhyasana is an effort only. You go and sit with a teacher. Diligently you study. You think about it. You have to assimilate it, correct? So to assimilate it, only if you assimilate it, it becomes your knowledge. Otherwise, it is still whatever the guru is saying this, shastra is saying this means you are not owning up to it, correct? It's not going to be useful to you, in fact, if, you, if it is only factual knowledge. See, that's why Vedanta Shravana, or studying Vedanta is not factual knowledge you are gaining. Understand that. Of course, facts also you have to know. <laughs> But it's not for factual knowledge or it's not, to, like I said, it's not to get a PhD or anything. None of you are here to get any certificate. I am not giving you any certificate also. So, it's not about gaining a certificate or gaining a job or, in fact, it's a totally useless thing, correct? That way. It's not going to give you anything, but still all of you are attending. That is because it is to see yourself differently. That whatever knowledge you are gaining, it has to become your knowledge. In the light of that knowledge, you have to now see yourself differently. Whatever you have been seeing yourself till now has given you only Dukkha, correct? That all of you know that. The way you have been looking at yourself in your own judgment, you are not acceptable to you. So the fundamental problem being one of self-non-acceptance and the root cause of that is you are seeing yourself in a particular manner. Now, what does Shastra do then? Shastra comes and show you a tot shows you a totally different vision about yourself. And then you have to see yourself in the light of whatever Shastra is showing you. That is the Pramana Vyapara, in fact. Every Vedanta class is about that only. When you sit in a Vedanta class, it is not just a factual knowledge that there are three bodies, five koshas, etc., etc. Okay? And there are so many prakriyas are also there, correct? There are different 
Shrishti Prakriyas are there. So many explanations are there. All that is fine. Everything has to finally lead you to seeing yourself as you are. To appreciate your own reality. It has to become your knowledge. Your vision about yourself has to be transformed. And that transformed vision only will then reflect in you as Ananda also. Right? It has to lead to finally some kind of Ananda. You, Shastra, Vedantins cannot be, the pursuit itself should be happy. It should be joyful. It's not something, in fact, that's why most of our sadhus are all like that. If you go and be with them, they are not very serious people, understand that. They are all chilled out people only. And they are very independent also. That's why it's somewhat very difficult to get a few of them together also is not very easy. Our people are all, they have their own something always. But anyway, the idea is that this Shastra Shravana Manana Nididhyasana has to lead you to assimilate the knowledge, the vision of Shastra, and it has to transform the way you look at yourself. And so what do you know from that? Is that I am one. I am in fact the only one in fact. Ekameva Advitiyam, correct? That's what is being taught here also. Ekameva Advitiyam. I am the only non-dual reality. I am the only conscious being who is Ananta, who is who's not touched by anything else. So that is coming out in this analogy of sun. Okay. And then another analogy also is given here. What is that? Ghatika di krita nabhasopi yatha. Nabhas means space again. Okay. Nabhas is space. So many words are there, correct? Akasha, kha, nabhas. These are all different words for space. And even this analogy is not Totakacharyas. Understand that. This also is coming in the Gita, where yatha sarvagatam saukshmyad akasham no palipyate sarvatravasthito dehe tathatma no palipyate. So, yatha sarvagatam saukshmya, sarvagatam, this, uh, this akasha is there everywhere, correct? It pervades everything because all the things are there in space-time, we say, correct? That means space has to pervade everything. It is sarvagatam, but it is also subtle, saukshmya, sukshma. It is very, very subtle, means nothing really divides the space or anything, or nothing even touches the space. Space gives, accommodates everything, but by accommodating anything, it is not sullied by whatever it is having, correct? Space itself cannot be dirtied or polluted. Pollution is there only for atmosphere, not for space. So, Sarvagatam Saukshmyat Akasham Nopalipyate, it is not still touched. It is all pervading, all the objects are in space, but it is not touched by any of them. Similarly, Atma also is there in all the body-mind sense complexes. In fact, it is there even where there is no body, where, where we, whatever we call as insentient also, rocks, etc. Also is Atma only. Consciousness alone is giving its own Satta or existence to everything. All objects of cognition are also consciousness only. They are all a manifestation or appearance in, cognition, in consciousness. Both subject-object are only appearances in one consciousness. So that being the case, but is consciousness affected by all the problems which are there in body-mind sense complex means no, it is not touched. So this Akasha also shows the same, this analogy also teaches the same thing, that there is only one Akasha. Although you may say the one part space is 10 liter, Another part space is 5 liters and all that, correct? There are so many part spaces are there, fine. But if you break the part, is the space is broken or what? No, there is no, in fact, it is only 
it's still utility is there understand part space as a utility that's why 5 liter part is different from 10 liter part it may be even costlier or cheaper in fact 5 liter should be cheaper than 10 liter so like this we can have vyavahara based on the capacity of a part and the utility also may be there but in reality space itself is not divider or anything like that that is the beauty so both analogies are given in fact some people take all these analogies to certain extremes correct and create what we call as vada and all that so the pratibimba vada they will say means if you take the reflection of sun as the main analogy and you can talk the entire shastra based on that it becomes pratibimba vada or avacheda vada they will say if you take the space itself and then based on that anal analogy you explain everything you teach the shastra with that means that is avacheda vada but we don't have to go into vada and all that even bhashyakara himself does not do that my guruji also does not go into all these things because some people then hold on to it and say that only this vada is correct or that vada is correct analogies are there always to explain to you whatever the shastra is teaching at least whatever the shastra is teaching it is possible the possibility of that you have to see afterwards the va validity you are not seeking through analogy understand that that is the difference that is the mistake many people do analogies will never be 100% same as whatever is being taught by the shastra it can never be also it is only ekadesha sambaddha will be there some point of the analogy will match whatever the shastra is teaching so bhashikara himself points it out here correct like in both these analogies ekatvam is taught that there is only one space or one sun and then both of them either sun or the space are not touched they are not affected by whatever uh, they are lighting up or whatever they are whatever is there in them that is what is the teaching you have to restrict yourself to that don't extend it once you extend the analogy too much you will get confused because everything will not match that is not the idea also of putting out an analogy analogy is to show you the possibility that there can be one thing which can appear in many as though many correct and as though it is having manyness correct that bahuta but still it is untouched by any of the things which make it appear as though it is many that point is what we have to understand here rest that is fine the once you understand that shastra itself is a pramana for that correct shastra only is the pramana to say that there is only one atma which is untouched it is nitya shuddha buddha mukta swabhava all that shastra is revealing to you in fact there are many shastra vakyas correct uh, there is uh, if you take uh, bradharneka we are doing correct bradharneka ekadha eva anudrashtavyam neha nanasti kinchana you have to see it as only one there are neha uh, nan he here here there is no manyness there is nothing many many and all is not at all there many is only an appearance only you have to see the entire thing as only one ekadha eva anudrashtavyam this is bradharneka of course chandogya i already told you ekam eva advitiyam only sadeva somya idam agre aasi ekam eva advitiyam only one sadvastu is there was there will be there even though the world has come up from it world is sustained by it world will go back into it also but gita also is similar another verse in fact 13th chapter this whole thing is based on 13th chapter i think because avibhaktam cha bhuteshu vibhaktam eva chasthitam like this there is a verse i think in the middle of the 13th chapter avibhaktam this atma is avibhakta really it is not divided it doesn't have any manyness but vibhaktam eva as though it is divided into many it is appearing as the sentience in many being so this one atma alone undivided indivisible partless whole appears in many as though it is divided into many and it is the bhuta bhartrucha bhuteshu grashishnu prabha vishnu cha 
so it is the one which supports all the beings bhuta bhartra while in the sthiti kala and grashishnu means what it is the one which <laughs> eats everything which swallows everything or everything resolves into it only and prabhavishnu means during srishti kala from which only everything comes so it is the infinite potential from which everything appears in which everything sustains into which everything resolves that potential is is ishwara correct right? ishwara is the one who is having that potential that potential itself is called maya or avyakrita undifferentiated and all that okay avyakta unmanifest so many words are used for the same thing so there is only one reality and all the manyness etc we have to understand are only due to upadhi so here the different reflecting media are called upadhi or the different things like part etc which divide the space are also called upadhi so the bheda any bheda or bahuta here manyness or divisions are only due to the upadhi it is not intrinsic to atma now what is this upadhi upadhi means in english adjunct like that they give a translation again adjunct is a word most people don't understand i think adjunct or adjunct only correct it's called okay i think uh or we can say conditioning factor i think that is an easier thing to understand upadhi is a conditioning factor i like to use the word conditioning factor better means it makes something which makes something else look different <laughs> or have a certain quality which is is does not really have correct so the traditional analogy is what japa kusuma so there is a flower red flower hibiscus you can say and it is there near as patika patika and japa kusuma are given so the crystal is transparent doesn't have any color now you put a red flower behind it what happens means the crystal looks red but there is real there is no redness in crystal itself correct but it appears to be red because it is now it has now as though borrowed the redness from the flower so here that red flower is the upadhi it is the conditioning factor it is conditioning it is as though conditioning we have to say even that conditioning is not real understand that it is as though conditioning the crystal to appear red so the word upadhi also technically it is explained how upa samipe upa means samipa nearby so samipe sthitva being near something else sviyan gunan anyatra adadhati it gives its own quality or guna to something else so upa samipe sthitva sviyan gunan anyatra adadhati iti upadhi like this an explanation is given for upadhi so in this case again all these differences are only upadhi krita that comes out very clearly the manyness of sun is how is the it is there means because there are many reflecting media the manyness of space means because there are <laughs> so many parts are there or whatever objects which are as though dividing the space in fact bhashyakara in the bradarnika bhashya recently only we saw that in the other class he makes a very very pertinent uh, observation uh that how do we explain this oneness and manyness everybody has to explain uh, the oneness and the appearance of manyness everybody also has to explain the moksha avastha and the bandha avastha because all the bharatiya darshanas they talk about a bandha avastha because currently everybody is having some problem or the other and you are studying the darshana or shastra only to get rid of the problem or resolve your issues so they have to make this difference 
Now, all the other Dvaita Shastra make the Baddha Vastha itself real, correct? They make it real. And then they try to give you some solution. You have to go to Golok Brindavan or some heaven. You don't know whether you like that heaven or not. They gave some definition of heaven also. Okay, where there are rivers of wine flowing, etc. Some heavens are defined like that also. Understand? And people are ready, ready to kill others, others also in the hope that they'll go to heaven. Or they are ready to do suicide in the process killing others. Hoping that this fellow will go to heaven. So it's a very powerful idea. People can be brainwashed with that. But our Shastra is very clear. It says, heaven is there. You can go to heaven if you want. But even that is only a karma phala. It is only a result of your actions. And it will come to an end. Once it ends, you have to come back. So it's not a permanent solution at all. Shastra itself says that. But even then, any theological explanation of Vedanta is only tourism promotion. Understand that because all of them are only talking about there is no Jeevan Mukti even though they talk, talk about a Mukta Avastha or a state of being liberated they talk about that but that is not possible in this life. You have to die and then go somewhere you have to go to Vaikuntha or Kailasha or Golok Brindavan like that. So that is the only thing they talk about. And uh, they are also struggling to explain how Vishnu alone, somehow Vishnu has to be more real than everybody else, correct? They also have to talk about a hierarchy of realities. And Vishnu is untouched by Vishnu or Shiva, whatever you can take. He uh, represents the Asamsari, correct? He is Asamsari. Vishnu or Shiva themselves cannot be Samsari or ones who are struggling, correct, like a jiva. So all these differences, how are they explaining? It is very difficult for other. Or even how did the creation itself come about? Means they have to say the Vishnu really became this creation. Because Parinama and all they have to talk about. Either it has to be a modification. But Vishnu became the creation means then Vishnu is still there or not. All this if you start questioning, it becomes very difficult to maintain. Then they have to say, no, one part of Vishnu is unchanging, another part of Vishnu is changing and all that. That's crazy, correct? One, one part of Vishnu is changing, but other part of Vishnu is not changing. And whatever changing part has become this world, they have to say. Or, in fact, that only comes here, correct? Avikritaha. Avikritena, if you see the second line, this unchanging reality is very important. Invariable. Everybody has to accept an invariable because the invariable, if it is not there, the change cannot be cognized, correct? To know that something was this and something is this now or something. So the between the past and the present, the difference is only the change. And the one who is cognizing it cannot change. The one who has cognized that has also changed means then there cannot be any perception of change or there cannot be any rec recollection also. So, Pratyabhijna we say in, in Vedanta. So, to recollect something, there has to be somebody who was there then, who is now then, now and both are there same without any change. In fact, the Buddhists have a very <laughs> interesting theory here. Okay. So the Buddhists say, so they accept only momentary consciousness because for them there is nothing like Brahman. They are talking about Shunya. Uh, but they have to also account for this common experience of recollection and <laughs> observing change. Correct. So if everything is momentary, the momentary consciousness cannot Cognize change, it will become. So then they say, no, no. <laughs> when the when the previous momentary consciousness is dying, the new momentary consciousness perceives it. 
so they are now talking about a flow of dependent momentary consciousnesses so when the previous momentary consciousness dies or is destroyed the new one cognizes that and then continues and again it, it this itself is destroyed one more comes like this but that is ridiculous theory even then that this entire so it has to cognize or know the entire previous momentary consciousness like that so that theory also is very illogical in fact if you ask a few questions it becomes difficult to sustain but they have a theory like that buddhists also because they don't accept an unchanging invariable reality itself so but vedanta is very clear all the differences are due to upadhi and so the change, the differences are there only in mati bheda he says mati bheda krita tu tatha bahuta so the manyness or the many sentient beings many awarenesses which you think are there are only due to the differences in the mind correct in the internal organ antakarana the mind itself is subtle and it can manifest this sentiency but the sentiency which is manifest in each and every mind or even body is supposed to be conscious correct a living body is a conscious body because it is able to uh, it is able to uh, process stimuli respond to stimuli external stimuli it is able to respond so a living body is also conscious mind also is conscious senses are all conscious but these are all borrowed property only it is not their intrinsic property because the dead body doesn't show that correct dead body doesn't show any consciousness awareness etc so this consciousness awareness cannot be intrinsic to bodies and therefore you are not really seeing many consciousnesses you are only seeing many bodies that is not a problem nobody can see another consciousness there is no another consciousness because consciousness never is an object of a cognition or even if you say i saw another consciousness <laughs> or then who is the one who is saying that that becomes a problem correct Th then that consciousness is seen by another means it will become infinite regress so that's why shastra is very clear there is only one consciousness the manyness is all only due to this upadhis many many body mind sense complexes are there and that is what makes it as though it is many the bahuta is only eva yatra dvaitam eva pashyati like that even bridarneka says where you see as though there is duality then everything is there <laughs> birth death old age all problems are there but the reality what is the reality here tava buddhi drishaha avikritasya sada but the one who is seeing whatever is happening in your buddhi in your intellect that consciousness is avikritaha it's not changing it's the invariable in every cognition and that invariable is the ananta it is the, it is only one it is one and it is limitless so that is what is taught here that one unchanging reality is you all changes are only happening at the level of sukshma sharira the subtle body or the antakarana the internal organ mind so body and mind they are all changing but the awareness the consciousness which is you is unchanging it never changes in fact so that same teaching is continued into the next verse dinakrit prabhaya sadrishe na sada jana chitta ratam sakalam swachita viditam bhavata vikrite na sada yata eva mato sita eva sada 
So as the, even though in the previous verse, the analogies are very clear, correct? There is only one Chaitanyam. That Chaitanya itself is untest or it is invariable, unchanging. And the changes are only then at the level of the body mentions complex. But the same, that point is now explained in more detail to show that change is there only in the body mind sense complex. Atma does not change. Atma is untouched. It is invariable. So, like even Dhinakrit Prabhaya, that's what. Sadrishena Sada Janat Chitta Ratam Sakalam Swachita Viditam Bhavata So, like the sun is lighting up this entire world. Like that, the Atma is lighting up all the body, mind, sense complexes. So, whatever is happening in each and every body, mind, sense complex is lighted up by the Atma, which is Avikrita, which is not changing. Therefore, what? Like even the sun, which is untouched by whatever it is lighting up. This Atma also is untouched. It is Nitya, Buddha, Shuddha, Mukta, Swabhava. Asitaha means here unbound, not bond. bond the bondage, etc. It is not a located. Consciousness is not located in space-time or in one body, mind, sense, complex. Understand that. Everything is in consciousness. And it is the one which is lighting up the space-time also. So it is not bound, it is asitaha, sada, always it is free. And it is unchanging. Whatever is changing is there only in the body mind sense complex. Like even the sun relatively is unchanging, correct? But the world it is lighting up is changing. Even during the day, so many things are changing. So like that, we have to understand. So the same, the analogy which was given before is now explained in more detail in this eighth verse. Ninth verse, it is continuing. The same analogy is further explained to show that how the body mind sense complex changes for a cognition to happen. So here our epistemology also is explained here. In fact, the details in this are all dealt with in a lot more uh, elaborate manner in other texts like Vedanta Paribhasha. So let us see that ninth verse now. Uparagam apeksya matir vishaye vishayava dhritam kurute tu yataha tatayeva mater vidita vidita vishayas tu tataf parinamavati. So tataha parinamavati, therefore it is changing. It is the one which has changes, which is having these modifications. What, what is having this modification? Huh? This mati or the mind only. So he's talking about the mind. And so mind only is changing. Atma never changes. That is what is the teaching here for the last few verses. Atma is the unchanging, invariable reality. So now whenever a cognition happens, then... Does the atma, doesn't the Atma change? I am the knower, correct? <laughs> knower changes means no. The change which you are talking about is happening only in the mind. In fact, how does knowledge take place means according to our theory, the mind goes out through the sense organs and takes the form of the object. The mind is subtle and it takes the form of the object. And that's what is here shown as Vishaya Avadhritam Kurute Uparabam Uragam Apeksha Matir Vishaye Vishaya Avadhritam Kurute Tu Yataha. So, because the mind is taking the form of the object by going near the object. 
uparab ragam here means it is going near and having a certain relation or connection see even the nayaikas define pratyaksha jnanam that is perception as indriya artha sannikarsha janyam jnanam they say indriya and artha the sense organ and the object have to come into contact and the knowledge which is produced by that contact is called pratyaksha according to them but what about whatever is there in your mind alone you are seeing correct right? so they include mind also as indriya in fact in their definition but so basically certain objects are there only in mind so mind directly takes the form of those in in that case for those things which are only in your mind but for the other objects which you actually perceive externally then the 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 indriya the sense organs and the object come into contact with each other and then that produces a certain knowledge they say but the vedantin takes it further vedantin says correct in sense perception there has to be a contact between the object and the and the senses but during that contact what happens the mind goes out through the sense organ and takes the form that is what is called manovritti according to us it is a state of mind one part of the mind takes the form of the object and that is called vishaya avachinna chaitanyam also so whatever consciousness which manifests in that form of mind or state of mind is called vishaya avachinna chaitanyam so the chaitanya which is that is the manovritti vritti avachinna chaitanyam sorry vishaya avachinna chaitanyam is the object itself object also is consciousness only for us so the vishaya avachinna chaitanyam is the object then the mind which goes and takes the form of the vishaya and in which the consciousness is manifest or appears that is called vritti avachinna chaitanyam sorry manovritti avachinna chaitanyam and the vishaya avachinna chaitanyam and manovritti avachinna chaitanyam have to be the same then only knowledge takes place is our theory so here also uparavagam means what basically the mind goes and it goes near the object vishaya and then takes the form of it so with apeksha means depending on this contact this uh, we have to say contact means it is very intimate contact uparagam apeksha so depending on that only the vishaya is discerned or known so it is like what they say is one part is there so you have to understand is very interesting see normally if a, if an object is not in the range of your senses it is not known correct but still all of them are only chaitanya like there is one part space there is another part space they both are in one space only but still we say this part space is separate from that part space correct but then if you put one part into another what happens they are now conditioning the same space <laughs> both the part spaces as though have become one that's what we are saying here also there is a vishaya avachinna chaitanya means the uh, the vishaya or object itself is consciousness but it is there it is as though conditioning a different consciousness then there is this manas or antakarana is there the consciousness is manifest here also but it is as though different from the whatever consciousness is there in the object but then when knowledge takes place when pratyaksha happens what happens the consciousness which is conditioned by your mind and the consciousness conditioned by the object become one and the same like two parts are in the same within one another and they are conditioning the same space when that happens then cognition takes place knowledge takes place so that is what is explained here by totakacharya and that is why he says certain things are known certain things are not known because it depends on whether the mind is able to go and take the form of that object or not whichever object is not available for this 
activity it is not known or it is not directly known at least we can do some inference etc but even in inference we have to say that that object is still objectified through the inference in your mind and then it is known so mind still has to take some form some vritti has to be there in the mind then only knowledge takes place so in all this the mind alone is changing that is the point which is being conveyed here the change is there only in the mind because mind only is uh, having its vritti or it is it is having a certain disposition it is taking a certain form therefore it is the parinamavati okay tataha parinamavati means what therefore it is the one which is undergoing changes which is which is having change mind has the changes happening so that the manovritti can happen and through the manovritti only knowledge or cognition takes place but the atma the consciousness which is lighting up or which is appearing like a reflection in that manovritti itself is unchanging it doesn't undergo any change in fact it is the invariable that invariable is required avikritaha unchanging invariable cognizer is that consciousness so it does not change in any way so the past few verses it is very clearly taught that the changes are there only in the upadhi the upahita chaitanya the conditioned consciousness never undergoes any change it is all only as though change it's all only appearance the the consciousness itself is invariable unchanging limitless and that conscious being is yourself you are that conscious being that's what you have to hold on to okay so rest of the things we'll see in the next class om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva avashishyate ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओम धन्यवाद जी